Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aubrey Turner. Thank you all for joining our panel discussion this afternoon on uh, customer identities and data. And <clears throat> before I go any further, uh, and you've heard the topic referred to as SIAM, right? Uh, and again, customer identity, um, ac customer identity access management, excuse me. <clears throat> A little bit too much coffee, I think. So <laughs> I'm excited to present uh, an illustrious panel, and they're all great speakers. So rather than myself introducing them, I'll ask them to introduce themselves, starting at the end with. Hi, my name's Nikki Doty. Oh, thank you. Well, really, do we need this? There's like, yeah, can y'all hear me? My name is Nikki Doty. I am a consultant with the Digital Access Management Practice at Optiv. I've been doing identity since NT4 days, if that dates me. So I've been around a little while. Hey, everybody. Janelle Schock. I'm a practice director with Optiv, and I lead a great team called Strategic Consulting. And we focus on um, maturity analysis, workshops, assessments, and kind of guiding overall strategies relating to enterprise and customer IAM and data programs. Who's got the mic? <laughs> Uh, my name is Andy Walker. I'm a practice director at Optiv. I run the digital access management practice, so that's all your traditional access management technologies along with uh, privilege. Uh, my name is Matt Connors. Uh, I am the IAM lead at uh, Southern New Hampshire University. I'm responsible for uh, customer identity access management as well as enterprise and identity access management, so the entire solution for the entire organization. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. So, uh, so again, we're here to talk about uh, Siam, and um, to dig a little deeper, I'm going to ask one of our panelists to kind of expand on that a little bit. But from my perspective, and excuse me, I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> Let me start there before I jump in. My name is Aubrey Turner. I am a director of, uh, of uh, client services focusing on identity access management. And I work with uh, my Optive colleagues helping our clients with identity access management solutions. So that's a little bit about me. So at, a, at its highest level, uh, customer identity access management, or SIAM, not to be confused with the country now known as Thailand, uh, is about uh, the integration or, or the joining of uh, CRM and identity access management. So customer relationship management and identity access management. And so it's the, the, the intersection of those two, those two concepts. And so I want to dig a little deeper and starting with Janelle, can you expand on that and, and give our audience a little bit uh, deeper view of, uh, of SIAM without using consumer identity access management in that description? I'm sure. Gonna, I'm just kidding, by the way, but go ahead. <laughs> So um, CIAM, or as some people say SIAM, um, I think that we break it down into various components. We think about where are the identities originating? Uh, are they from self-registration? Are we talking about business-to-business -business consumers or customers, or are we talking about direct consumers? But all of those different identities have to originate somewhere. Um, how do we manage that identity information and the attributes about those different users? We think about how are, how are, are those people, once they do exist within our systems, how are they authenticating? And I know Andy and, and, and Nikki are going to talk a lot about a different access management type of uh, objectives and activities. Then we think about how do we control the privacy of that customer information? How do we uh, deal with the experience of those customers? And I don't know if you want me to dive into any of those different topics, but it's really about who our customers are, how we can protect their information, how we can get them access to the right systems to do whatever it is that they're trying to do, and how do they prove they are who they say they are um, appropriately with what they're trying to access in our systems and the different data that they're trying to manipulate. Sure, so thanks, Janelle. Let me pivot to Andy for a second and just, uh, Andy, can you talk about the role that digital access management plays in a SIAM program? Yeah, so there's really two core components that we deal with like from an integration standpoint. So you have your tr traditional front door access, your SSO, federation, adaptive authentication, and contextual authentication, right? Who they really say they are, you know, trusting those pieces along with the registration process that goes with it. And then you have the directory services, the underlying kind of 
directory of all the consumers and how they you know retain that the, how you retain and maintain basically those records. So those are kind of the two pieces we see from like a technical tactical integration point of view. Um, Janelle can probably expand a little bit further around you know kind of everything's outside of the, the technical things. So. Sure. So um, when we think about uh, the experience, for example, so a lot of times uh, when we're from a security practitioner perspective, we're thinking about how can we control and protect data appropriately? How can we make sure that nobody gets in that shouldn't get in and they can do what they want to do, right? We're all very familiar with that. Um, but one of the key components of or what I believe and we believe is a key component of CIAM or, or the SIAM space is to make sure that the customer experience is appropriate and, and a good experience so that they don't leave us to go somewhere else where the experience is better and so that we can actually you know, not make it a frustration for them to you know, interact with our systems and use our services and hopefully um, we can continue to get their money and, uh, or whatever it is that we're trying to get from them. So when we think about, do you want me to go into the experience side of things, or I don't well, want to pivot too much. Yeah, yeah let's, let's have Matt talk, talk through that experience side and his, his, your perspective, um, you know, being somebody that's sort of hand, a lot more hands-on. or. Sure, so our goals around this space are to do precisely that, which is to bridge identity in our CRM system. Uh, our goal is obviously to clearly engage our potential customers much earlier on in the process than any traditional higher education organization is. We want to be engaging with you prior to you even being submitting an application. So it's it's bridging that self-service experience and then allowing you to continue to use that, that and I'm not a huge fan of the term, but the bring your own identity piece through our systems up until a point where we deem it appropriate that, hey, we want to now give you a Southern New Hampshire credential. We want to make you part of, more part of the family. But we want to enable you though through that seamless experience to provide us as much information as you feel comfortable providing us, all the way up into and including the application process, which for us does include that initial transaction piece of you paying a deposit to come here. So, and the challenge piece for us has been finding ways to do that with, while increasing security, but improving the user experience. And the challenge for us has been, to kind of call back to the keynote this morning, is to kind of make identity invisible, so to speak. Um, somebody should not have to come to us and then get yet another username and password. We want to make that experience as uh, seamless and hopefully frictionless as possible, unless they do something really weird and then we would absolutely introduce friction in the form of MFA or what have you at that point. So from your perspective, um, sorry to ask a question, no, I know I'm not yeah. the moderator, but I was just thinking about what you were saying and um, when you're talking about like the registration process, a lot of times it starts at the application, like they're applying to go to the university, right? And so just from, from some of the experiences that I've had um, working with higher ed organizations, a lot of times we found that the application systems can be separate from like the systems when they're actually a student or they've become an alumni or whatever. Can you talk a little bit about any challenges or anything that you've seen in that space? Yeah, so the, the challenge for us is, um, for our organization, we accept the common application just like every other higher education in North America does. Um, but we, being the uh, the, basically the largest online university in the United States. We, our primary application, app, application app is, is homegrown it, for us. It is, it's, it's developed a combination of an internal application and, and the world leading CRM. I'll let you figure out what that is. Uh, the challenge for us <laughs> though is, is that it is the transition of data from app to app. And we've put a lot of time and effort into that for us, it's an API bus. This shouldn't be news to anybody. Um, and the piece that really makes that experience seamless for us is the transition of data from application to application. We initially were building one-off connectors to try to enable that experience, and it became just unmanageable. So we, we have transitioned to a, a basically an API bus that allows us to say, hey, you know, Janelle, thank you for applying. We would love to provide this to you in financial information, like financial aid, compensation, what have you. And then when you transition to being a full-blown student after you register, uh, we do that basically all through back-end systems. So 
some users in other schools might be accustomed to entering the same piece of information three, four, five times. We, we want you to enter it once and then update it if you want to, but if you have no need to give us that same piece of information again, you should only do it once. So let, let's talk. A question? Yeah, well, you want to ask a question or you want me to ask a question? I, I have a question um, based on what I was just hearing. So I, I was wondering if when you were designing this solution, right, were you thinking about, were you going about the thought process as your consumer, as your customer goes through the flow, or were you thinking more about it from your needs from an IT or a business standpoint? So, so it's both for us. It starts with the, we call them user stories. So the, and the user story is a challenge for us because we, our customer base is not the normal higher ed customer base. We're not going for the 18 to 21 year olds. Don't get me wrong, we have plenty of 18 to 21 year olds. Uh, our average student is, is between the age of 24 and 42. So where we have to take those multiple user stories of whether it's a mid-career professional or somebody who's not as familiar with technology um, and, and take that and then write a, a user story that includes what experience we'd like to see. Our team will then, and it's not just my team, it's a much broader team, will engage to find out how do we enable that. So it's more of a user-driven story than an IT-driven story. Don't get me wrong, as we're hearing our user stories, we're thinking about like, can I make that safe? Like, or where's a, what's a way I can enable a, a seamless experience, but hopefully in the process, make it safer while we're doing it. So we're not just taking like blanket exceptions of a social identity or something like that, but how can we improve the experience and improve security? So of course you're, you're balancing security risk and, and ease of use. All day, every day. Right, <laughs> all day. So I'm gonna start calling you all day Matt Connors. Um, so, speaking of security, right, and so I've got a background in identity, as many of my colleagues do, going back, you know, it's kind of like the early 2000s, and we were building, deploying web access management tools, really with the intent of securing an e-commerce app. And so what I want to explore a little bit further, and Nikki, maybe it's a question for you to start with, or, or you to answer, is how has the security community, the identity community, sort of pivoted and responded to SIAM needs, right? Versus just, hey, I need to secure this transaction to what we're talking about now, right? Customer relationship. How has the security space changed in order to help us all address those the SIAM needs? So when we think about how the security space has changed, we have to think a little bit about how the customer experience has changed. So we have industry disruptors who have now set the bar, right? You know, everybody, everybody you talk to wants an Amazon-like experience. Oh, sorry, branding. Oops. <laughs> sorry. File number Shopping one. Cart, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the rules. We don't mention any uh, corporate names, but right. Nikki's violated that rule. So, so anyway. Very large online retailer experience, right? <laughs> <laughs> But the consumer is also very, very aware of their identity and how easily it's stolen. I, you know, the, we hear it every day. So what we are looking, what we're seeing, what we're looking in a CIM space is how can we make that, uh, I'll use your term, frictionless, right? How can we flip it from a username to a password to using the device that's in your hand every day? And, and then what do we do for those consumers that are a little bit older and maybe aren't as comfortable with those devices. But a, a comprehensive solution like that is really gonna think about the customer experience, make it frictionless, and then just secure that data on the back end. You know, the, the APIs, uh, that whole concept just makes it so much easier for the user to know what they're granting, what data is being granted access to if that's a better way to put it. And yeah, Andy, yeah, can you? Yeah, just, uh, just to add to that. So I think this is the first time we're actually seeing security products in the last, well, Amazon, large <laughs> online retailer. <laughs> Again? <laughs> basically invented, it reinvented I mean, the idea of how, how user experience can drive revenue, right? And, I, and definitely in your world, the user experience drives revenue with an online presence. So this is the first time we're seeing security products actually take I don't know, user experience and consideration in the last eight, 10 years. I mean, a lot of times you're dealing with the web app story, which is consumer-based for the first part yeah. of it. 
but you know the initial SS RSA tokens and those type of things were all kind of forced design on the employee. Like they didn't really care about the employee's experiences. Like this is security. This is what you're going to do, and you're just going to live with it. Uh, that has changed dramatically. You know, we have the adaptive authentication. You know, the seamless user experience for both employees and consumers. It's kind of just moving in that direction where they're looking at security as a revenue generating solution versus it just being what it used to be. I think. Oh, do you mind go? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Who? Who first? Matt. <laughs> okay. So, for us, on two two points there, we we have started to measure the the frictionful experience of if this application is there's too many buttons to click, I don't want to upload that many documents, or why in God's name are you asking for like my birth certificate right now? Uh, we've measured that to how many people make it through that process versus how many people drop off, and we do direct measurement to to revenue for us at that point. The, the really the big piece there is, is, is making sure that we're getting correct information and good information. And then the, a big challenge for us, and maybe some of the panel could speak to this because I'd love the help, is uh, how we start to de-dope those identity pieces and making sure that we're still talking to that same person, that first John Smith. We have two and a half million identity records. For us, that's a, we have more than one John Smith and making sure you're that John Smith. <laughs> You know, from the state of Massachusetts, who lives in the city of Waltham, you know, there's probably more than one of you, too. I was going to... Yeah, Janelle, you were... Um, yeah, add to that. Actually, I was trying to think of something ha that we could do to talk more about that, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about from the experience side that, that you were talking about. Um, you know, when we... We didn't used to really focus on experience, like we I think we mentioned in the beginning of of our chat, right? And but now we have these massive multiple ways that we can interact with each of our different organizations. And so, like you could, you know, for your perspective, we could be emailing the professor. You could be utilizing your online applications, and you can be doing all kinds of different things, all of those different ways. If you're, you know, when I flew here on Monday. If we think about the airline experience that we have now, right? So I, I fly a, a large uh, main carrier. I guess I'm not going to mention the name, but you know, you go. Y y we have a travel team, so the travel team books my flight, and then but maybe I need to make an adjustment. So the travel team has my unique identifier, and um, which could be like on your site. I, probably you have like a student ID. I mean, I certainly had one when I went to school. That was a long time ago, though. I don't know if they still do that, but. Um, you know, you have your unique identifier, your frequent flyer number, or whatever that is. So the travel team uses that. Then I can go on their website and I can, you know, put that in. And then I could actually call the airline and say, "Hey, I want to, you know, upgrade myself. Here's my unique identifier, my my flyer number." And then I could go onto my mobile app and I could change my seat at, on the mobile app. But it's all just the one identity. They know who I am and everything that they need to know about me, no matter how I interact with them. And then when I feel physically show up at the airport, you know, I can use that same app to actually get through TSA. So t they're sharing the information with TSA. I can get through and get on the plane just with that mobile app that I have and all because I have this one unique identifier. So it's interesting that they've, you know, and we've been doing that for a long time. And if you think about that, that is a customer experience, um, a strong and positive, usually, if yep. your plane's on time, a positive customer experience. And, and I think we're seeing more and more uh, organizations approaching this omni-channel um, thought process. Like Apple, you can, um, I don't know if any Again. of you are, 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 are Apple. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Uh, well, keep going, Janelle. OK, so you have, you know, a phone <laughs> type. <laughs> can we really not say Apple? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like we can say Apple. I've already said it. I'm going to go with it. So um, <laughs> you can have an Apple phone and you can, you know, you have your Apple ID, right? And you, you can make purchases on, you know, buying music or whatever with this thing. And then you can actually, you know, go to something else and buy apps with it. And then you can go into an actual Apple store and you can just pull stuff as long as you have your phone on you you can pull stuff off the shelf and literally just walk out of the store without ever interacting with another human being which I think is fantastic and you know and but they know and they can just charge your account because you have this thing so it's it's you know you have your your, your ID for this unnamed company and so um, it's it's a rich, it's really interesting how we're more and more focusing on the on the customer experience but all of that ties back to their identity 
this ID that they're using and you know how they pay and all of that there. So it's it's cool how it all ties back together and really the root of all of it is is the identity and the data that we're trying to protect or allow them to have access to. So Janelle, you was there any other I, I, Scott, I actually wanted to pick Matt's brain on. So consumers there's a big push for ID proofing, right? And ID proofing can be very intrusive depending on what granularity you want to get to. Uh, depending on what business you have and all those things are, are how, how far you go down that road. I was wondering if you could kind of tell from like your level business, of assurance. level of assurance you guys use. Uh, so for us, we, we have to think about level of assurance depending on the interaction. So it does depend on where in the life cycle that you're interacting with the organization. Uh, when you're applying or just kind of seeking basic information about us, I don't really mind telling anybody who will listen the courses we offer, how much tuition costs, all that stuff. Uh, however, you matriculate, we choose to offer you financial aid. Uh, we, the federal government, has requirements for us on certain levels of assurance there. That's definitely a step up, like that, uh, if we use NIST, it shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, that's that IL, uh, IAL now, I'm trying to remember the new one, two, for us. So we, we need to take an additional assurance for that. And there is want, and it's, it's reasonable criticism for our products since we're primarily online. Um, we want to introduce higher levels of assurance to test taking because uh, a, a common criticism that we receive being online is, well, how do you know that you know little Timmy doesn't hire somebody else to sit down and take their exam for them? And the honest answer is in some cases we do, in some cases we're less sure about that than I think we'd like to be. The, and for us also, th these levels of assurance to a degree become an expectation. So before, some schools would say, oh, it's a competitive advantage for us to be safe, for it to keep your information private. Now, for us, also through evolution of, of regulation for us, it's, it's really, it's an expectation. Uh, we have to, we, if we lose your information or something happens to it, we have to just close that to you. We have to send you a letter. We have to, in our case, we'll call you. Um, but th there's a lot associated with that. So today, we don't, we're not, we're viewing that less as a competitive advantage, but more of a, a we're becoming proactive at it, so it's it's not so much uh, an advantage as it is an expectation for our clients. So uh, it, it's, students, it's, sorry. So thanks, Matt. It, it's come up twice now. I I, I don't want to talk about the privacy piece of this. So you guys heard me kind of make that little joke about uh, Siam. Siam is now Thailand. What I found out today or yesterday is Thailand actually means land of the free, and for me that has associations with privacy. So with all this data being collected right, to potentially make the end user experience uh, more seamless, more frictionless. What are the ramifications or implications from a privacy perspective in terms of a SIAM program? Don't all I'll sit say the, there and look the, at me. The, <laughs> the biggest piece for us is, yeah. uh, is that consent. Ah, uh, the, okay. Letting the user know that, hey, by logging into this application, you know, you know, this is the information we're going to share with that that app, whether it's your first name, last name, and email address, first name, last name, and, and, and something. Um, we haven't quite hit the point of being letting the users control which information goes out to which applications. And at the end of the day, there are certain apps that I don't really have a choice uh, as to what information, what unique identifier I provide to that app. What we are endeavoring to do, though, is to obfuscate that unique identifier as to a not legally protected thing as much as possible. Uh, but that's a that's a transformational effort that's actually in process for us right now. So is, are you dealing with any, I imagine you have students globally. So right. has, yep. right? So has the California, the new California privacy regulation, has that changed the way? My compliance doing? and legal team would love to talk to you. <laughs> I, I, I can make some kind of appointment, but uh, the rest, rest of the panel, thoughts on privacy and SIAM, what are, what are, what are your thoughts? I was just going to say, I mean, everybody, every time I create an online account anywhere, the consent form is always there. I am going to say I've never read it end to end, and I have a hard time believing our consumers read those things end to end. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, it, it's, you're opting in no matter what, and uh, I, just, I just don't, I think that we challenge our industry a bit better to, to be a little bit more <laughs> inclusive when it comes to those type of options because just a consent is, is not really doing our consumers justice, I don't think. 
I think you said a really key word there, opt in. Yeah. And the idea is that most of the things that we have to do, we're trying to opt out of stuff. You're just opted in automatically. Yeah. And um, we're seeing a really big movement with CIA um, uh, you know, programs where we're moving towards opting into things instead. Uh, and that just means, okay, you maybe just have some basic services as a customer, but you can opt in to all of these different other things. And some of those things might require you to provide us more information, but we can actually give you um, the pieces and parts of our privacy policy and how we manage your data, how we're, co how we're the custodians of your data. Are there other people that are going to receive your data because you opt into this other service? We can actually make our policies much more easily understood and much more kind of finite um, because we've segmented out our different policies this way. So if we actually design from the ground up with policy and data privacy in mind, we can really make it so that it's, so that it's much more uh, you know, interesting and, and, and available and understandable by our customers. Like I just installed a new video game that's an online video game, for example, and it literally, it makes you scroll through the whole thing before you can click the checkbox, usually you don't even have to do that. You know, you can just check, click the checkbox and move on with your merry way. But it was, it was probably like the length of the IRS code. Like it was insanely long, and of course I didn't read that because I wanted to play my video game. But it, but you know, if if they had a different way for me to say, oh, if I want to buy loot boxes, then maybe I can give you some more. You know, maybe I can read your privacy policy applicable to loot box. I'm being a little silly right now, but but it's it's legit. Like maybe I would have actually read it if it was in consumable chunks. Right, Nikki. So if I take this away from the customer point of view for a minute and think about this from the technical point of view, one of the things that, that these programs can do is help you consolidate, deduplicate and transform the data, right? With, with these different systems, you know, the Bursar has a system and the Registrar has a system and everybody has a system and all the data is everywhere. From a security and privacy perspective, it, when we consolidate that data into these comprehensive solutions, we can now control it, we can now make sure that it, it's the same data across all of the platforms, which can then provide us with a little bit more level of assurance that the data is accurate and we have one place to protect it instead of multiple places. To, to that data and, and to tie in the user story piece, it, I would encourage folks to go through a data mapping exercise, uh, whiteboard out the entirety of one user story that you have, whether it's customer, employee, what have you. And then in each of those steps, walk through all the applications that they're interacting with and then walk through what pieces of data flow through those applications and whether they just flow through it or whether they actually live there at some touch point. And it's, for us, it was a, extremely eye-opening exercise as to the just the number of places and just just to speak to that app point you know registrar has an app then the registry the uh, course management has an app then we have the application portal itself and it's it, I, I think we ended up in one case where somebody who's fairly early in the life cycle their their content was stored in six different applications all completely relevant to us in some degree but not all that data needs to live there long term at the end of the day, in some cases, your application just needs a unique identifier. That's it. And then the sensitive stuff you can put somewhere much, much better protected. Any additional thoughts on that? OK. So <clears throat> on the data front, we've kind of touched on how that potentially could be seen as a, a pitfall, right? Uh, something you have to work, work around. And you know whether it's realistic to uh, gather the right stakeholders to perform that exercise. It, it actually is is key. Sometimes there are, there are challenges getting stakeholders together in the same room to be able to to capture that right and its critical path kind of activity. So, what other pitfalls do you think somebody might encounter if they're going out and building a a SIAM program? And Nikki, let me start with you. Politics. <laughs> You got, you got to cut through the BS and get everyone on board because these folks are used to this is my app and my data and my app and not my data and I don't want to rewrite my code to look at it this way or that way. So you've got to get that top-down approach and you've got to cut through the politics if you're truly going to be successful. How do you do that? How do you make that happen? Well, I'm blunt, so. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki is blunt. You guys should try that. <laughs> 
I think, Danelle? Well, yeah, one of the things... <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, because I, I want... I think, I think you're going to expand on that. I think um, one of the things that we talk about with zero trust, for example, is the idea of teaming and really breaking down the walls between the different teams and, ha and working towards something that really works you know, for the business or for our customers or whatever, but still has security in mind. So, you know, have you had any experiences where you've been able to successfully break down that, break down the team to be able to work towards the objective? Yeah, um, you know, we usually get folks in a room and we... Like have locked, to, like a locked room? Occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> we don't bring in lunch till everyone agrees. <laughs> no, but really, we, we just have to find that common goal, right? And then we just, when, we, when you encounter that resistance, you, you just have to back it up and, and keep working until everyone agrees that there's a common framework. And sometimes you can't. And then that's when you just have to find somebody with a big enough hammer to make it happen. But usually when everyone sees the common goals and everyone agrees that that's where we're going and you can't stand in front of it, then they get on board. Otherwise they're left out and nobody wants that. We have a lot of success around bringing the what's in it for me piece. And that's in talking with the conversation of, hey, how do you, how do, you do your job? How are you taking in information? You know, tell me about your day to day and you know, what, what's the pain point you experience around whether it's interacting with technology or the fact that you have to pay somebody to go walk a piece of paper over to something, scan it into some other system or something, and then find something, a problem that you can solve for them. And if, if you're lucky enough, and I think in identity, it's pretty easy to find these problems, uh, you can say, hey, what, 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 if I, what if I could solve that problem for you? What if that went away? What if that was automated? What if it was you know, more like that big online retailer experience? <laughs> that we can't mention. <laughs> So what, what you're talking about is, and we are in Washington, D.C., right? Politics. Oh, yeah. I think Nikki said it, right? Politics, trying to avoid it. But there is an element of, like, political and politicizing the program to achieve your, your goals somewhat. And again, each environment, each, each, each of our customers has different environments and cultures and things. So you need to understand that and work through that. Andy, did you have any thoughts on the, the political aspect of, um, you know, working through a through a SIAM program? I mean, it, it, there's an investment that organizations making with people's time, with software, and all those things. Um, if you can't get the right buy-in at the right level from a top-down perspective, you're never going to be successful. And that's identity programs in general. I've really been on an identity program or deployed an IGA solution or anything like that. If you don't have the buy-in, the collaboration, you're never going to get it. People, it, when you, one of the first things when you go into a project and we see it's a very siloed uh, initiative, we know right away we're going to run into problems, right? So, you know, we, we do our best to consult on what constraints and they really have and where we need to go. And sometimes we have to kind of take a pause and let them kind of sort it out and tell them and we, we kind of reinvest. So um, it really is making sure that the common goal tops down set up. And then when we see silos, we just raise our hand early saying we can get this far, but we're going to run into this point right here and we just, we're going to have to stop. So what do you want to do? Do you want to hit that point or do you want to try to solve it end to end with a plan that's going to be inclusive of everybody? So let's, and again, I don't know, Matt, did you have a thought on that or just, okay, so uh, we're, we're talking about SIAM, of course, and again, seeing it as a strategic imperative, right? And that's kind of what, uh, sort of a vibe that I'm, I'm getting. Uh, let's talk through a little bit about how we can, how SIAM can be uh, a differentiator or a commercial competitive advantage in, 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 in the frame of it being, again, a, a strategic imperative. And maybe Matt, maybe that's a good, a good place for you to start with. The, so the, the, the consumer advantage. identity experience for us is critical. It needs okay. to be a competitive advantage for us. Yeah. Not only do we want to make it easy for you to uh, you know, explore SNHU, learn about it, and then eventually sign up and attend, but we definitely take a, a lifelong learning approach. Yeah. So we want to make that reentry process just as easy for you. So that, you know, hey, great, congratulations, you have your undergraduate degree. Maybe a few years goes by, you get a few bumps up in the organization, and then your boss comes to you and says, you know, a graduate degree would really take you to that next level. And then transitioning them from a, a traditional undergraduate student to a, a mid-career professional is a, a differentiator for us. Another differentiator for us is uh, a group that we call workforce partnerships, and that's um, basically extending consumer identity for us to a partner organization. Ah, okay. Example for that is we have a partnership with uh, Walmart. If you are a Walmart employee, you can uh, attend SNHU at a discounted rate. 
uh, a roadmap view for us is to allow a Walmart employee to bring that Walmart identity with them. Today, it's it's right. it's still kind of separate, separate, but it's it's using those types of things as a competitive advantage for us that says, hey, you know what? And especially in our our in higher education, where there's a, a there's a lot of dread around. Oh my God, I have to go back to school. I have to go get this degree. I have to do this 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 huge daunting painful thing. And if we can just make that experience like, oh, signing up wasn't that bad. It wasn't that expensive. Well, yeah, I, I can take this class. Six weeks, I got that. You know, by, by reducing, again, the friction, we, we can deliver a better client experience and then have people say when they, hey, I got to learn something again, I'm going to go to Southern New Hampshire. So, so Matt, you basically don't want Wally World to go find another supplier. Nope. Right? Exactly. I imagine they're pretty big. They, they want to join us, and we want them to stay there. Right, right. Janelle, you're smiling, uh, <laughs> as you should. What are, what are your thoughts on, in, in your experience so, so far with our customers uh, and Scion being very strategic uh, and a competitive differentiator? What are some thoughts that you have around, you know, again, helping customers, helping our customers get that competitive advantage over, you know, whoever they're competing against? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, go. <laughs> go, Nikki. All right, so thinking about a large entertainment company based in Florida <laughs> <laughs> who takes this to a different level, right? They've got a customer identity program where you get an account and then you link it to an RFID band that you wear everywhere. It lets you into your room and it tracks you in the park and it tells you when your kid is not in the same place as you in the park all through a mobile app. So that data analysis that, that that little RFID band combined with your ID gives you is such a competitive advantage. It's not the customer experience. I mean, yeah, sure, it's great to just go like this and buy a $10 Coke, right? That's great. <laughs> Prices That's just right. went up, That's right, right folks, a $10 Coke. $10 <laughs> Coke and a little ice cream bar shaped like a mouse. <laughs> I did not say it. <laughs> But the, the data analysis that, that bringing these identities together provides you can give you a true competitive advantage, right? You can sell more stuff. That, that is, and I'm aware of that use case of that company that's based in, in Florida. The experience is the same whether you're floating in the middle of the ocean, whether you're on land or in one of the hotels or wherever you are, that experience is the same. I don't have any kids, at least that's what I've heard, so I'll take your word for it. Um, <laughs> uh, Janelle, have you had some time to think about it, or should I maybe move to Andy? I think, I think it's good to move. <laughs> good to move to Andy. All right, Andy. <laughs> yeah. Just all the ideas I've had were just uh, oh, okay. already talked about. <laughs> all right. I mean, the only thing I really add to that, I mean, Nikki hit it on the head, like that example's classic, but you have all the online retailers, they track your activity, they tell you what you need to buy, right? I mean, I, I don't find that as a, I find it as a competitive advantage for an organization to attract people. I find as a consumer, highly annoying um, that they're tracking all that data about me. But um, anytime that you can kind of, you know, Verge your activity versus what you're trying to achieve is, is is that's that's a true power of data and how we can you know achieve like that single threaded you know outcome. I, I think that's interesting. Um, the finding it annoying because I w I recently bought a my mom turned 70 and we went to a Pin and Tonics uh, concert last week for her 70th birthday. It's her favorite band. And so now I'm getting all of these pin and tonics like related band things, and I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not what I want to do. <laughs> I did this one thing one time. So I mean, taking some of that analytical information, like, did they just take this one elective course? Did they just happen to do this one thing that you know was a one-off thing, or is this like the fourth or fifth time that they've done something like this or bought this type of thing? And then can we actually use some of that more information to make a more appropriate experience for our customers so it's not as annoying as getting seven thousand emails from this one from you know this ticket selling company um, you know, about these related <laughs> types of tickets when I've literally only bought one ticket. 
Um, but you know, but maybe I buy a lot of books on an online retailer company and um, see, I did good that time. And yeah. <laughs> you know, now they know kind of what the type of books that I like are, so they can actually make some better recommendations. So I think that that's a definite competitive advantage. It's not just about having the technology to be able to do these things, but actually learning the behavior of your customers and making and utilizing that technology appropriately for each individual customer. Sure. So we've got about 10 minutes left, and I thought maybe I would turn to the audience for questions. Does somebody have a burning question that they'd like to ask? Don't make me grab the mic and just run out. I have a question about math. Oh, there we go. Oh, hold on. Let me, actually, hold on. Let me grab this mic. I, well, I mean, I get to walk out here. <laughs> So Matt, with your implementation or usage of SIAM, what was the biggest roadblock that you didn't see coming? What's the biggest challenge that we wouldn't have ever thought of? The biggest challenge that we never thought of was, was for us, because it was a part of our larger digital transformation effort, for us it was, in all honesty, business process mapping. And it's, it's, it's basically a really nice way of saying, make sure you know what everybody's doing with your stuff. Uh, we had not large swaths, we're a very large organization, but we had what I would call uh, strategic groups that had learned over the years that if they interacted with one piece of technology a certain way, basically an hour later an account would show up. Uh, and that was great. And we were interrupting that process in a different way. Uh, we were making it better for 90% of the organization. Uh, they did not view it, uh, I would say, in the same light. So the challenge for us was really closing that gap. So great, you have a technical architecture diagram. It shows you get a feed from this, and this is what you get for output. Making sure that you close the, close the loop on that story from end to end it was, was super critical for us. Uh, and finding all of them is super important. I know a lot of people tell you to shoot for 80%, but make sure you ask your leadership which, what's strategic and you know what's not. Yeah, that sounds like it's about figuring out how the sausage gets, gets made, folks. Anybody else have a have a question? Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have a question. No? All right. Why don't you let them say the brand name? No. <laughs> <laughs> they can say anything they want. Yeah, you guys. Oh, here, here we go. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Yeah, so my question is, uh, what is the connection between uh, managing internal SIAM to marketing tools that kind of attack the other side of the coin, right? It's kind of like red team, blue team. You're both looking at the same thing from a different perspective. Oh, you great, great question. Yeah, so um, that actually goes a little bit back to the analytics stuff that um, I think we were mentioning just a, a few minutes ago, where um, definitely we consider uh, at Optive, we do consider that the customer analysis, understanding the data, not just from a security perspective, but also how they're using our systems, um, that's absolutely part of a, a well-rounded CIAM program. So if they log in, if your average customer logs into your website and uh, you know 60% of them have to scroll down in order to click on something that they want to use, let's maybe take that in consideration from a marketing and a website or app development perspective and let's push that up to the top. Let's see where people are clicking or if we have like a specific service that we have low adoption on but we really want to be focusing on that from a strategic growth perspective, you know, taking that into consideration, how do we market that appropriately to the right types of customers and present that to them no matter how they're interacting with our business, whether it's on the web app or their or website or their mobile app or whatever or in the store or whatever that is. So I think we can take that type of identity information, how they're interacting with our services, and then feed all of that back into our, the marketing team so that they can make specific focused marketing campaigns that work with how the customers are utilizing um, our services or our products or whatever it is. Another type of thing is like, um, 
w there's a company that uses, uh, like, makes smart basketballs. So, like, they can gather the information about, you know, the Internet of Things. So they can gather the information about how, you know, many dribbles that you're making and the speed of that and other types of basketball things that I don't know anything about. But, um, you know, they can actually gather that and tie it back to your identities. And then maybe they could see, hey, my basketball is been dribbled 10,000 times, I'm making a terrible analogy, but my, my basketball's been dribbled 10,000 times, and now I probably need a new basketball, but maybe I also know as a company that basketball players like buying other basketball-related things that aren't actually a basketball, and I can say, hey, we noticed that your basketball is kind of wearing down, buy a new one, but also there's these Basketball sneakers. towels or whatever. Yeah, sneakers. <laughs> sneakers <laughs> you know, these no. other things sneakers. that we make that are appropriate. <laughs> so we're gathering the information about what they're using, even if it's not just data that they're interacting with, physical things that they have, and then marketing towards them appropriately because we know who they are and we know what they're doing and how they're doing it. Does that kind of answer the question or did I go off on a tangent? No, no, I think that's a great, a great point. From, from my perspective, I think the, from a vendor perspective, the space is even fractured, right? You've got some vendors in the space that are sort of more aligned on the marketing side and they offer some access management tools. And then you have many of the access management vendors, several of whom are here, that are really good at access management and then they're sort of bleeding over onto the marketing side of things. And maybe Matt, you can kind of talk about how marketing, what you're building, sort of the role of marketing plays in that and, and help uh, address sure. Wayne's question. So the approach for us is kind of twofold. First was a facilitated discussion it's basically getting the two groups into one room and saying, hey, what information do we have? What information are we looking for? And that went both ways, both from the identity folks to the marketing folks and the marketing folks to the identity folks. And that came back down to the matching that quote unquote rando that's surfing on your website to maybe somebody who's been interacting with us before. Um, I like the term rando. <laughs> I don't know another way to put it really. <laughs> we'll go with that. Uh, so, got it. Uh, Nikki, is this something you, you, you want to? I'm just still stuck on the basketball thing. <laughs> I mean, now they can tell me, hey, look, there's a park down the street that's not busy. Exactly. And now you can take all that data and you can then mark it yourself um, when the draft comes up. Exactly. Because I dribble faster than everybody else. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think a piece for us, too, was. Oh, oh sorry. Let me grab that real quick. Thanks, Kevin. So the basketball thing actually made me think, well, it was a good example, but then how do you balance that with the need to, you know, with data privacy regulations? So we need consent, we need to be transparent about what we're gonna use this. So how do you get your marketing wizard together with everyone else to say, okay, we're gonna track basketballs? And how do you then, you know, you mentioned before too, actually presenting that in a consumable way to the consumer of, hey, we're gonna track your dribbles. Are you good with that? You have to opt in. How do you get those wizards together and, uh, and, and do that in a way that can actually work? Somebody answer that question in under three minutes. Okay, yeah. Um, it's a, that's a really interesting question. And I, I mean, I think it goes a little bit back to what, what Nikki was talking about with like teaming and breaking down some of those walls, right? And you have to start by designing what it is that you're actually trying to do. We wanna make a smart basketball Therefore, we need to figure out what does that mean? Well, a lot of it has to do with gathering the data. Let's f not take into consideration like the manufacturing elements, right? But we wanna gather that information. So we have to say, okay, what are our, policy, our pri uh, privacy policies look like? How can we make that privacy policy understood to, to that basketball user? Um, is it possible to use the basketball without gathering data from it or do you have Apparent, I'm sure you can just hit it on the ground and it does basketball things, but we want to be able to. <laughs> Sports is fun. <laughs> um, we want to be able, you know, to give them, this is an expensive basketball, right? So the chances are they probably know what they're getting into because the basketball inherently costs more. But, you know, we can work with marketing. Like, how, uh, how can we have messages that people actually look at? We're in such a 
such like a graphic world these days where we're kind of overwhelmed with everything visually, right? So how can we reach out to them in some way that makes sense for them? Do you have to have an app and then as part of the maybe app- Maybe the basketball they, talks to you while you're yeah, dribbling Yeah, maybe it. the like, basketball is like I'm recording one, two, your three. dribbles and reporting it back <laughs> no, to you. <laughs> you probably know. not. I mean, that would be a little, I think that would distract you from- What's wrong with that? Right? But, but I, I think- <laughs> The whole thing's already that. creepy. <laughs> I think that it's not creepy. It's an actual thing that is, <laughs> exists, this basketball. Anyway, the, I think the idea is to team and to really just start from the beginning of what you're trying to accomplish and then making sure that you have not just security, not just the manufacturing team, and not just um, you know, the, the, the marketing team or whoever it is, the customer team, but really getting participants from all across to design what you're actually trying to do, and then they have buy-in from the beginning. And if people feel like they have a voice that's heard, you know, they have a much more tendency, a higher tendency, I think, um, to really participate going forward. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> well, with this four seconds left, Matt. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Basketball. Uh, yeah. So, um, I don't even know where to go. We're, we're done, <laughs> we're, we're finished, we're, time's up. I just wanna thank you all for participating. We really appreciate the questions. We, we're all here uh, for the rest of the, con well, some of us are here for the rest of the conference. But if you see us, please feel, feel free to grab one of us if you wanna continue the conversation. Just a little plug, the next, the next uh, panel that's in this room is about digital transformation. So if you're interested in that and sort of how it's tied, I know that came up Please stay seated and join that conversation. But again, thanks, much appreciated. And thanks to the panel. Matt, special thanks to you for, Thank you. for joining. Thanks again. Really appreciate it.